Welcome to Concordia. Whether you're a longtime member or visiting for the first time, we're so glad you've joined us here for worship today. Concordia is a place filled with people who share a passion for God, a passion for sharing hope with others, and a passion for loving our community. Our service will be about an hour long and will include worship through music and singing, prayer for each other and the world, as well as an uplifting message and encouragement for your week ahead. If you're here for the first time, we'd like to invite you to visit one of the counters in the lobby after worship so we can meet you and give you a special gift to thank you for checking out Concordia. Children are always welcome in our services, but if you need to step out with them, visit our family room in the lobby where you can continue to watch the service live. Our free app provides a worship guide as well as sermon notes if you want to follow along. You can find the app by searching Concordia San Antonio in your favorite app store. Please take just a moment to go to our website or our app and hit the word connect, which will take you to our connect card. You can share prayer requests, learn more about serving, and find ways to get involved here at Concordia. You can also text CROSS to 51555 to get the connect card right to your phone. Each Sunday at 930, we have our adult Bible class, high school Bible study, as well as our Sunday school for children ages pre-K through fifth grade. The service is about to begin. Thanks for joining us at Concordia, and you're always welcome here. Good morning, Concordia. Let's stand together as we lift up our voices and worship this morning.
please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. And for those online, welcome to Concordia. We're glad you're here. You can see that all of the Christmas decorations are up, or at least almost all of them. They're not ready to be turned on. We'll do that on Thanksgiving Eve. And uh, that reminds me, I'd love to have you join us on Thanksgiving Eve. We have our service at 7 o'clock. Uh, that's in person with Holy Communion. Thanksgiving Day is online only. And so uh, I want you to be aware of that. In fact, it, it, for all of the services between Thanksgiving Eve and New Year's, uh, we've got a little card that we're going to send home with you today. So as you're walking out, you can pick these up. And pick up more than one, please. Pick up at least two so you can give one to someone else. Invite them to come and be part of worship this season at Concordia during the holidays. And so we'd love to have you do that as well. Right now, though, let's take a minute and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for your goodness and your love, for all of the blessings that you pour into our lives. Lord, for the opportunity to be people of gratitude. We, Lord, want to practice that. We want to grow in that. And so we lift all of this to you with, that, with gratitude to begin with. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's we'll stand up together and sing one more song as we start out today. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the crown, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need you got is honey in the rock.
please be seated. We continue our worship in the name of our God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As we enter into the presence of our God in this time of worship, we realize that He's holy and perfect, we're broken and sinful. And yet he offers that wonderful privilege. He says in 1 John chapter 1, anyone who confesses their sin, I am faithful and just, forgive their sin and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And so dear friends, I invite you to join me in a moment of confession where we lay our sinfulness and our brokenness before the cross of our Savior Jesus Christ. I would invite you to remain seated or kneel as you choose. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day and we confess what you already know, that we are sinful and broken, that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. We've sinned in the things we've done and we've sinned in things that we haven't done, that our attitudes reflect that sinfulness. But Heavenly Father, we're sorry for our sin and we pray that of your mercy, through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you would wash us clean and set us free. Dear brothers and sisters, I invite you to take a moment in the quiet of your heart and mind to confess your sins to God. I have good news, the good news of the gospel, that by virtue of God's grace and mercy upon this, your confession, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If the congregation would please rise for the reading of the scripture. The scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, where we read selected verses. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. The children in the balcony are invited to come down at this time for the children's message. Please join with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead, according to the Scriptures, and he ascended into heaven. The Son of God is the Lord of the world. He is Please be seated as the children come forward for the children's message. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Are you having a good week? And you know this is going to be a really good week because of something special. 
What's something special? Let's see. Let me look and see who. What's it going to be that's so special? Family and friends because of Jesus. Yes, that's always a good answer. But because of what else? Because um, there's nine days for the week and it's I thought that was a slam dunk. Okay, so wherever we were, it's going to be a really special week because of the Thanksgiving. Yeah, and that does have to do with Jesus and family and friends and all. So you're right. I just was looking for something a little more specific. And, and when we think about Thanksgiving, what's really neat about Thanksgiving isn't that we give thanks on Thanksgiving because we can give thanks on Thanksgiving. We do give thanks on Thanksgiving, right? But that's not supposed to be the only day. We're supposed to give thanks every day. In fact, I don't know if you know or not. In fact, I'll talk about it in a, in a minute. The Bible tells us that God really wants us to give thanks all the time. But that's kind of hard to do, isn't it? I mean, sometimes things don't go the way we want them to go, do they? And sometimes we feel a little disappointed, right? And sometimes we're a little bit moody. But you know what the Bible says? God wants us, wants us to give thanks all the time. When we're happy and when we're not happy. He wants us to give thanks when we're feeling good and when we're feeling disappointed. He wants us to give thanks all the time. So that takes a lot of practice, doesn't it? Yeah, that's really what it takes. It takes practicing being thankful. And so I wanted to tell you a way that you can practice being thankful. When you're, when you're driving home today, everybody drove, didn't they? Anybody walk in the rain? Okay, so when you're driving home, you can take turns with whoever's in the car with you, mom or dad or grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, and everybody can take a turn saying something that they're thankful for. Or maybe Thanksgiving. When you're gathered with other people, everybody can take a turn saying something that they're thankful for because that's one of the way we, 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 ways we practice being thankful is by saying what we're thankful for. And the more we talk about being thankful, the more we learn to be thankful in all circumstances. That's really, really important. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, wouldn't it be amazing if we could help these wonderful young people learn to be thankful now so that they carry that with them all throughout their life. So will you guys play that game later on? Will you do it? Will you give it a try? It's a fun game. Come on, will you try it? Okay, maybe. All right, whoever's with this one, we got a special hard case here. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Help us grow in thankfulness and help us grow in our trust of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good job, kids. You can head back to your seats. I hope you have a wonderful week and a great Thanksgiving. God bless all of you. As the kids are heading back, I want to thank all of you who support the ministry of Concordia. It's a wonderful blessing. It, what, a, what a gift it is. Those who are part of Loyalty Sunday and those who make contributions, thank you for your gifts. It's time for us to gather our offerings now. And ushers, if you'll come forward, know that you can make contributions not only through the offering plate, you can also do it through our online ministry. You can go to concordia.cc and you'll find the, the way to give online. You can also do it through the Concordia app that you have right there on your smartphone. But thank you for your faithful ministry and contribution.
as the ushers are finishing up their work, I, I want to also remind you of the gift of prayer, bringing our concerns and our thoughts and our heartaches and our joys before the Lord. We believe in the power of prayer here at Concordia, and so there are a couple of things I want to mention. First of all, if you would like to add someone or some situation to our prayer list, you can do that by going to concordia.cc forward slash prayer, or as I mentioned with the offering, you can also find uh, the, the tab that will allow you to add to our prayer list right through the Concordia app. We also have some folks that will be at the front of the church at the end of the service. They're our prayer partners, and they are here to pray with you. If you've got something on your mind, something you want to lift before the Lord, know that you can pray with them confidentially and that they will continue to lift you in prayer. Uh, and so just come forward and uh, meet with them at the end of the service. Right now, I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. You may kneel or remain seated as you choose, but let's go before our God. Gracious Father, thank you for this privilege to simply bow our heads and talk to the Most High God. What an amazing thing that is. As we come before you, Lord, we thank you for all that you are and all that you have given to us. We thank you for the birthdays and anniversaries and other celebrations. We thank you for holidays like Thanksgiving that sometimes we get it wrong, Lord, but we, we have the right intention. We want to give you thanks. Help us, Father, to grow in gratitude. To that end, Lord, we also thank you for those who serve to bless us, uh, first responders, police officers, firefighters, paramedics. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for our medical, or for our military personnel and for our medical personnel. We thank you, Lord, for everybody who takes the time and invests themselves in serving the needs of those around them. Thank you. Gracious Father, we also would lift to you our nation and our world for that matter. We pray that you will lead the, the government of our nation to conduct itself faithfully and well, that it would serve your purposes, that it would adhere to your principles, and that it would give glory ultimately to you. Lord, we pray for our world with all of the worn, torn areas. We pray for Russia and Ukraine, asking, Lord, that that, that that conflict would come to an end and that the destruction of property and the death of innocent civilian people would come to an end. Lord, we pray the same thing for the war between Israel and Hamas that you would bring an end to that conflict and that innocent lives would no longer be lost. Gracious Father, we pray for those suffering persecution. We know that there are brothers and sisters, Christians in Pakistan that are under severe persecution and we pray, Lord, your protection for them and your blessing, but ultimately that your spirit would hold them close in faith, that they would persevere to the end. Heavenly Father, all of these prayers we bring to you this day asking that you would strengthen us Allow us as individuals and as a congregation to shine brightly in this community with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray, and we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Now may this true body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven.
So we are working our way through this very appropriate topic. As we head toward Thanksgiving, we're talking about Thanksgiving. We're talking about gratitude. But, you know, it's not just because it's a, a, a seasonal theme. Gratitude is a really important part of our lives, and I think we take it for granted. But when you think about what Scripture has to say about gratitude, you really can't emphasize it enough. Did you realize that God's Word says that giving thanks, that gratitude is God's will for us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're like me, you need to grow in that quite a bit. And, and if you've been around for a while, you know that I've talked about the fact that I've, I've been sort of on a journey, and this has been one of the sub-themes in my spiritual life and in my devotional life, trying to grow in gratitude, trying to, to make my first response to circumstances, that, that reflex gratitude instead of worry or frustration or disappointment or looking for what's not there, that I actually pause, that I actually make it a focal point to be grateful. But it's a struggle, and it's a challenge. And if you're anything like me, you have the same challenge and the same struggle. I invite you into that journey to grow in gratitude, to actually live out what God wants for our lives. Because I think gratitude is powerful. As I said to the kids, it, it changes our whole perspective. I think that's part of the reason why God wants it. That's his will for our lives in Christ Jesus. So, <clears throat> as we've been talking about gratitude last weekend, Pastor Jeff talked about gratitude, and he really talked about some things that allow us to be more grateful. And in particular, he talked about content, contentment and rest. Remember in the context of Sabbath that he invited us to, to experience and to practice Sabbath because those are conducive to, they help us become more grateful. Today, I want to kind of go on the opposite end of the spectrum. I want to talk about something that is absolutely contrary to, in fact, something that stops gratitude in its tracks. And that's worry. You know, if you were listening to the, to the lesson just a few minutes ago as Jennifer read it, you, you remember that Jesus is talking about worry. He's in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. And uh, the reality is that, that what he's talking about is a way to experience life differently. Now, some of you have heard of the, the, the phrase that says, happy wife, happy Right? I don't know if you believe it or not, but you should probably, that's not scripture, but you should give it some serious attention. <laughs> you know, another of those adages that, that goes around that sort of comes out of the context of a family and relationship is that you're only as happy, as a parent, you're only as happy as your most, un, or your least happy child. Isn't that true? You're only as happy as your least happy child because even though our children, especially when they grow up, we can't control what happens. We can't control their decisions. We can't live their life for them. We can't solve many of their problems. The reality is if they're unhappy, if they're sad, if they're struggling, we tend to worry about them, right? We tend to worry about them because worry is one of those things that comes so naturally into our hearts and into our minds. In fact, when you think about it, in our culture, there are worried people everywhere. Polls and studies suggest that as many as 60% of Americans have a real problem with worry being a regular part of their lives. One medical study suggests that as many as 40% of Americans struggle with some sort of anxiety disorder. And the thing is, the experts all agree that instead of something that's sort of remaining stable or something that's actually getting better, that the level of people's worry and anxiety in our culture is getting worse and worse. And it's not just adults. It's adults, young adults, seniors, children. It's across the board. Because worry is one of those things that, that has this universal quality to it. It goes across gender. It goes across age. It goes across generations. It goes across all kinds of circumstances. The reality is there are all sorts of things to worry about. And sometimes that worry actually manifests itself in, a, in an actual disorder where it consumes our thoughts. 
But even aside from that, I mean, think about all of the things that we worry about. We worry about health. We worry about finances. We worry about our kids. We worry about our parents. We worry about our friendships. We worry about our jobs. We worry about, about our country. We worry about our world. I mean, there is no end. If, if we're inclined to worry, if we allow worry to take its normal course, there is literally no end to the things that we can be worried about until we get to the point that worry literally consumes our thoughts. Dear brothers and sisters, that is not God's plan for us. He wants to ex us to experience life in a completely different way, and his plan to combat worry centers in gratitude, in thanksgiving. So let's dig in. A few weeks ago, we were studying the the, uh, Matthew chapter 6, and it was part of our whole discussion on the Lord's Prayer, and we talked about it. We talked about it a few weeks ago in the context of stewardship. And the, the idea of Matthew chapter 6 is that God is trying, through his son Jesus, he's trying to bring us into this place of absolute faith, of absolute confidence in our God. And he talks about worry, and he uses a word that's, that's there in the Greek text, merimnao. And it means divided or distracted. Man, I love that that's the word that he uses because if you think about worry, that's exactly what worry is. Something that divides our attention, divides our thoughts. It's something that distracts us from, from our focus. And it's one of those things that right here in the middle of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is trying to go right after it and he says, therefore I tell you, do not be distracted. Do not be divided. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Now you notice that Jesus is pointing especially to things that are extrinsic. Concerns that he says, don't be distracted by what you will eat, by what you will wear, by the things that you, you, you have on your body, your clothing. Now just so that we remember, we think about these things, Extrinsic means what? Means things on the outside of us, right? Extrinsic. Means things like money and food and fame and clothing and stuff, all the stuff that's part of life. Those are things that are extrinsic. Intrinsic are things that are personal, things that are on the inside. Things that are meaningful, health, relationships, character, personality. And Jesus is saying so often, we get all wound up and all worried about extrinsic things. They distract us and they divide our focus away from things that are so much more important. And that's ultimately his whole purpose in the Sermon on the Mount. He's trying to get us to refocus on what matters most. But he goes on, he says, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Think about it. In the context of your life, in the context of the things that you worry about, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? So the cure for worry is not getting more of what you worry about. It's not about accomplishing something or, or receiving that thing or accomplishing that goal. The cure for worry is actually who you trust. And Jesus' invitation is that you and I would trust God, that we would trust him for everything that we have. We would understand his perspective and his relationship. We would understand his care and his love for us. And that that understanding, that perspective that, by the way, we call faith, that that faith would eliminate worry. I mean, think about what Jesus says. God takes care of the birds, feeds them, provides for them. In the fuller text it says, and he takes care of the, the flowers, he gives them the clothing that they wear. Aren't you more important to God than birds or flowers? The answer is what? Yeah, it's rhetorical. Aren't you more important than these things? Of course you are. Then if God will take care of birds and flowers, if he will provide for them in such abundance, why in the world do you doubt? Why in the world do you worry? 
about whether or not he will take care of you. The way the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 4, and my God, read it with me, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now think about that for a minute. His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That means everything that God owns, everything that belongs to God, which is what? Everything. And everything that he could ever need, he can speak into existence. And so what he's saying here, what Paul is trying to help us understand, is that out of the amazing richness of everything that God is and everything that God owns and everything that God can create with a word, it's out of that richness that he is going to provide for all our needs. Well, going back to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus goes right to the heart of the issue. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Another rhetorical question, right? Can you? No, in fact, we know scientifically that worry actually takes hours from our lives. Can any one of you add a single hour to your life through worry? The answer is no. It absolutely cannot. And what Jesus is pointing out is worry doesn't work. Worry is a vicious cycle. Worry is this whole mentality that that takes control and can overwhelm our thoughts. Worry is this, this habit that just like so many other habits, the more we allow it to be practiced in our lives, the more it controls, the more it dominates, the more it's our natural go-to. I talk about wanting to make sure that my reflex is thanksgiving. Well, the reality is it's much easier to have a reflex of worry because it flows out of our old sinful nature. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry too. Just can't get worked up like that. My watch gets all shook up. It's, <laughs> it's this, this vicious cycle in our lives that when we worry, we become inclined to worry. And the more that happens, the more that goes on, our natural reflex begins to be worry. And here's the thing. We say to ourselves, you know, if I can only take care of this, if I can only have this, if I can only get this, if I can only accomplish this, then I won't worry anymore. And it's all part of the lie. It's all part of the the addiction to sin. Because that's where this all comes from. It's our old sinful nature that drives this inclination to worry. Because think about this. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were tempted, and though the, the story makes it seem like they were tempted to eat an apple, but the fact is they were really tempted to be like God. Did they want to be like God? Did they want to take control of their future? Did they want to have the kind of authority and control that God has? And the devil made them believe if they ate the fruit, they would. But they didn't. What happened instead is that their lives were stained with this mentality that says we can be God of our own little universe. We can make our own rules. We can decide our own path. We can accomplish whatever it is that we want. We we don't have to worry because we're in control. And the fact is that runs right smack dab into the face of reality where you and I have learned from an early age we are not in control. We do not have the authority of God. That we don't get whatever we want. And that sometimes things don't work out the way we like them to. And instead of filling that space, that gap, with trust in God, believing that he is a God who loves us and cares for us, that he will provide all of our needs out of his richness in Christ Jesus, we fill it with worry. And it consumes us. And in the process, it steals our faith. Jesus says, therefore, because it's, because it's not good for you, because it steals your faith, because worry doesn't work, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So if we're not going to worry and we struggle to trust, what do we do? Well, dear friends, there's a, there's a passage that talks to us about this whole idea. It's that same section from Philippians chapter 4. 
Because in place of worry, we, we substitute gratitude. And what Paul says is don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with what? So think about what he's saying. In everything, with prayer and petition. Petition, it means asking God. It's part of our prayer life. So through prayer, we bring everything to God. We tell him what we need. We tell him what we want. We tell him what we're struggling with. We tell him about the things that make us anxious and we're inclined to worry about. We lay it all at the foot of the throne. We bring it all to God in prayer. And we give thanks. So we're not just telling him all the stuff that we need or all the stuff that we're worried about, all the stuff that we're stressed about. We also tell him all of the things for which we are grateful because when we practice gratitude, it causes worry to shrink. It's like chemotherapy against worry. In fact, it's a simple formula. Prayer plus thanksgiving fights worry. Prayer plus thanksgiving fights worry. In fact, I love this. So we we read this in Paul. He says, with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, bring all of your requests to God. But the fact is, Paul didn't invent that. Paul didn't create out of his brilliant theological mind. He didn't create the idea that prayer and thanksgiving is what we need to do to combat worry. It's Jesus who actually brought the idea to us because in Matthew, in the few verses before this section on worry, Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. It's Jesus who says prayer and thanksgiving combat worry. Because Jesus knows that talking to God is better than worrying to ourselves. The Apostle Peter puts it this way. Cast all your cares on him, on God, because he cares about you. What's it mean to cast all of that on him? What's it mean? It means we pray, right? It's a word picture that we take all of the things that, are, that cause us to be anxious, all of the things that we need, all of the things that, that are going on and, and cause us any kind of stress, we take all of that and we cast it onto our God. We tell him. We pray. So I want to go back to Philippians for just a minute. So in Philippians 4, It says, with prayer and thanksgiving. So we talk to God, we let him know what's on our minds, and we practice gratitude. But let's be honest, unless you are absolutely some kind of super Christian, it has not become a reflex for you. So what can normal people like us do? How can we practice gratitude? One way, I've talked about this before, you keep a blessing list. Whether it's something that you do with pen and paper or whether it's on the note section of your phone. I'd actually suggest on your phone because we have a tendency to have our phones with us wherever we go. Write it down on your phone. Make that blessing list and just take, a time, take time every morning or every evening to, to write down two or three things for which you are grateful. They could be situations from that day or they could be overall life situations. But write those things for which you are grateful. Because when you're struggling, when you're trying to to find that courage to be grateful instead of worry, you can go back to that list and be reminded of all of those things, all of those blessings that cause gratitude. And you can refresh that gratitude over those very same things. You know, I've talked about this before with a prayer list. One of the things that's powerful in our prayer lives is to keep a prayer list. And it's not only a list of the things that we're praying for, but it's also a list to the answers to those prayers. Because that prayer list, we can go back to that. When we're praying about something and praying about something and nothing is happening, we begin to say to ourselves, maybe God isn't listening. We can go back to our prayer list and say, oh, wait a minute, I know he was listening here, and I know he was listening here. And if we can trust him in those places, we can trust him today. The same thing is true of that blessing list. That same God who has blessed me with these things in my life is a God who will continue to bless me because his character doesn't change and his love for you doesn't change. Today, tomorrow, and for eternity. The second way we can practice gratitude is connected to that, to that idea. You know that in the past we've had the text messages that go out between Thanksgiving and New Year's. How many people have been part of that in the past? 
I invite you to subscribe to that again. It's called Growing in Gratitude Text Messages, and all you have to do is type the word thankful to 51555. And so each morning, from Thanksgiving morning through New Year's morning, somewhere, it's usually between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, but it, it may vary slightly, you'll get a text message, and it will just be this simple prompt that reminds you to pause and give thanks about something or some way that God blesses your life. And the prompts are all different, they're all different things, but I find them helpful. Because then if you take just a minute and you, and you give thanks for those things that it reminds you of, and then you take the time to actually record those thanksgivings in the note, the note section of your phone, you've added to your thanksgiving list. Do you get the idea? You say, well, man, that's a lot of thanksgiving. Exactly. That's who we need to be. We need to be people who do a lot of thanksgiving, not just on a day, every day, all the time. When I think about that, I think about someone who practiced gratitude. My sweet mom. And she passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, there was a particular moment. There are a lot of moments, but there was a particular moment near the end of her life that's just emblazoned in my memory. She was struggling with a lot of things. She, she was battling with a form of dementia that meant that sometimes she was clear and sometimes she wasn't. She was struggling with heart issues and lung issues and struggling with issues in her body and she was really, she'd grown very, very weak. And she wasn't able to get out of bed. And as it turns out, this would be the last week of her life. And when Julie and I got to the house, we walked into the room where she was resting and I said, hey mom, how are you today? And she said, I'm a mess, but I'm happy. Think about that. I'm a mess. I mean, dementia, heart failing, lungs failing, body failing. Last week of her life, she was a mess. By human standards, she was a mess. So how in the world could she be happy? Because she was so grateful. Every day she lived with this mentality that she was grateful for what God had given to her. For the way he had blessed her and more than anything else, she was grateful for the way that he loved her because she believed he loved her with an everlasting love. You know it's true, don't you? That's how he loved my mom. And that's how he loves you. In John 14, everything has gone crazy in the disciples' world. Remember on Palm Sunday, Jesus rides in. He's famous. He's the miracle worker. And the people are shouting, Hosanna, son of David. They want to make him king. And so it looks like it's going to be awesome. They've, they, they've bought the right ticket, right? They're on the right coattails. Everything's going to be wonderful. And they're going to be part of this, this new reign. And the Romans are going to be driven out. Their names are going to be written across history as these great conquerors at the side of Jesus. And lo and behold, by the time we get to the middle of the week, everything has turned rotten. Those same people that were shouting Hosanna to Jesus are now thinking about how can we get rid of him? How can this guy betray us like this? They, they hate him. And the disciples see and fear and, 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 and have all of this going on and they don't know what to think and what to do. And Jesus says these words to, him, to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. What's he saying in our language, in our common parlance? Don't worry. Don't worry. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you, to be, take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. What's he saying? He's saying there's nothing, nothing that can separate you and me. That no matter how dark, how disturbing, how upside down the world may be, you can trust me. You can trust my Father and you can trust me. Why? Because his love for you is everlasting. 
Because nothing can change the way he feels about you or his heart's desire to provide for you. So here's what it comes down to. You and I, we're never going to be able to predict the future. We're never going to control the future. But we know who does. And he loves you with an everlasting love. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for that love that is so powerful. You sent your son to take my place, to take our place, so that we could spend eternity with you. Lord, grow our gratitude, because as our gratitude grows, I know our faith grows with it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine, especially during this holiday season, shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. Let's sing together. Have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful